How are you? I'm Connie Lim and welcome to my live with Domestica. Um, today I'm going to share with you how to um, illustrate Audrey Hepburn and kind of use my technique um, to create an illustration. So a little bit about me before we start. I'm a fashion illustrator and um, I also teach as a lecturer and I'm doing a course with Domestica. But um, I think I just love drawing and I love drawing fashion because it's quite exciting. So I've kind of devised my own technique and the way to approach different media. And at the moment, I'm in the phase of just drawing with color pencil and using dry media mixed with wet media, which is um, watercolor, gouache, um, and also kind of extending it to collage and utilizing 3D materials to create something more interesting. Because um, it's so exciting, you want to capture all the energy. And um, I thought, you know, exploring different ways and how to portray uh, different imagery and make it more unique. So if you can check my screen here. So today I'm going to show you um, this image and work with this, and we're going to keep that on. And we're going to kind of interpret this in my style, I guess. But before we start, I just want to show you a little bit about the iconic Audrey Hepburn that I think really identifies her as an individual. If you look at closely. She has really interesting eyebrows, really um, big eyes, round shaped, and quite big nostrils, actually, and a very small chin area, and a, a um, kind of a square jaw here. So I've actually pre-drawn my sketch to show you. As you can see, I've really emphasized the eyebrows here, the nostrils and made her jawline a bit shorter. So usually my working process, I sketch everything else and then it's a really weird technique that I kind of figured out a way to approach it, but I actually draw everything out and then I erase it. <laughs> so because I'm really experimenting with color pencil, I can Erase that and then, you know, drawing with this line makes it more interesting. And I actually have several colors here that I'm going to work with. It's more of a brown to pink tone with gray and black. Because I think this doesn't have that much color, that we can really emphasize these colors on the face. And of course, use the black for the contrast. Can you hear? Yeah. So let's start. I'm going to kind of color in her cheekbones. You see that makes a big difference. And what I'm doing, I'm just grading. So, and let's try it with this different color. Let's change this line to this color.
So already that makes a big difference. Oh, sorry. We're having audio issues. Does that work? Is that better, the sound? Okay, perfect. So let's move on with the colors. Can you well, audio check? Can you hear me? Okay, I'll just unplug this. Yep. Is that, Is that better? better? Can you hear me better? Okay, is that better? Okay. Is that better? Uh, it's going, it's the lowest. Yeah, I have the headphones on.
I'm just trying to switch my camera. I still hear the echo. Is that better? If I'm using my laptop? <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, it's better. You can hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, I'm just trying to get my camera camera to camera to go back to that way. Come on. I may have to just move the camera that way. Is that okay? Okay, okay. Hold on one second. <laughs> Should we just do it that way? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, cool. I'm ready. <laughs> Should I carry on or? Okay. Okay, sorry guys. Um, technical difficulty, but we're back. So now I'm going to color in the face. So I like to use my paintbrushes. I'm just going to show you the main four that I use. And this is a sable brush, so it's a bit bigger. Medium, and then these two small ones. This one's my absolute favorite because it's series seven. It's a bit expensive, but I love it because it really works well and gets um, fine lines. So I'm gonna take the medium one, this one, and I'm gonna just block in the whole shape of the face. So I'm just going to erase my extra lines that I have. I know I work in a weird way where I draw everything and I start erasing it. Slightly. So I'm gonna block in the face with like a beige color. With a bit of gold. I'm leaving the whites of the eyes 
like so. Very light color, you don't want to go a bit too dark. Like that. Just so I know that shape is there. Right. And while that's waiting to dry, I'm gonna put my first value on my hair. And she has black, dark hair. So then I can just block that in. And I know also her glove is black, so I'm just going to block that in as well. So I drew the shape of her glove. So with wet media, it's really interesting because you just have to do things um, separately. So while one thing is drying, you can go block in another shape. So it's like utilizing your time quite well. So what I'm doing is I'm actually putting in my first layers. So with painting, there's lots of layers that you can add. So this actual shape is the tool cape. So if you notice here, I'm putting my tool on top afterwards. So I know she's wearing a black dress underneath. So I'm just gonna block that in. Actually for this one, I'm gonna use a bigger brush. So it's faster. I chose this outfit because, you know, her iconic look is actually the black dress she wears at breakfast in Tiffany. But I thought this tool is a way for a chance for me to use my collage technique, which I will show you. And which is also a part of my course for Domestica, which is fashion drawing with collage. Drawing my base. So this is her iconic black dress. And the reference is obviously Givenchy. She was one of their muses. Yep. Also while I'm doing that, I'm going to add the skin tone for the arm as well. And this you can do a bit darker because we're going to put something on top of it anyways. So I'm blocking it in. All right. So now that I have the skin tone and it's a bit dry, I can go in and make it a bit more detailed. So I'm using Arches paper, which is really nice because it dries very quickly. So you can work a bit faster. So I'm going to go in and add my shadows and I tend to add my shadows where the, obviously it's deeper and it chisels in. So the eye sockets are one. Like so, And then we have a brow bone here so I'm going to keep that quite light here as well. Tucking that in, and of course, underneath the nose creates shadow. It looks a bit dark now, but once it's dried, it does tend to dry lighter. Of course, I'm going to put shadow for my ears. Let's go a bit lighter with using gold for my shadows here. I don't know why, but I'm quite obsessed with gold gouache. It's really hard to tell, uh, for example, on Instagram, but if you actually look at it in person, it's very sparkly and it's quite nice. Uh, underneath the mouth, there's a shadow here. 
and it kind of curves in for the ball of my chin. So we have a ball of our chin there. Do the jawline. I like to use my finger to blend things in sometimes. I think Audrey Hepburn is quite interesting because actually she has a very low square jaw and that can be translated as a masculine face, but for her, somehow she doesn't look masculine at all. All right, so I got my shadows in. Um, I'm gonna give her red lips because I love pinkish red lips. But I'm gonna water it down so it's my first wash. That's a bit too strong. That is really strong. <laughs> So my first wash. So everything I paint, I paint with layers of values. So getting the light shape in. And once it's dried, you can like sculpt it a bit more, go in deeper. All right, so now I'm gonna go in and do her eyebrows, her famous eyebrows. And because this paintbrush is so thin, you can actually make really intricate lines. Maybe that's a bit too dark to start with. So I'm gonna water it down a bit. I love her eyebrows. So because the eyebrows are so strong, we need to match that up with the eyes so it doesn't get lost. So because it's dry, I'm going in. And I'm going to leave some white spaces to mimic highlight in the eye itself. So that matches already the eyebrows, the values. Let's deepen the crease in her eyelids there. I like to draw eyelashes on the bottom. Do the same for the other side. Eyelashes going out. Ooh, came out a bit dark. So yeah, it's coming together. I'm gonna go down to the nose. And she does have really big nostrils, but you don't wanna make it too dark because it looks a bit intense. So I think that's quite dark. I'm just going to smudge that. And define the bottom a bit more. Maybe the other side's a bit too dark, yeah. And again, I'm gonna go in and define the ears, inside of the ears a bit more like that. For the jawline, I don't recommend doing a really harsh line. Maybe you wanna do it a bit darker and then lighter and then darker. Because if you put such a harsh line here, it can look like the head is separate from the neck. So instead, I recommend connecting the neck and the head so it looks more together. So I actually have my medium and light and medium values. Now I can go a bit darker for the contrast. And because this is such a black and white kind of outfit, that's what I'm highlighting and using the most is my black and my white. But I'm gonna add a bit more color with my color pencils afterwards. Let's define the hair. Now that we have the solid shape, you can go in and add the little highlights in the hair, or you can even 
you know, add some hair that's kind of falling out or something. I'm going in here because I made a hat separately, which I'm going to collage on top. Let's go down. Clean the ear a bit more. Just going to go in and solidify my glove here. Ooh, what does a good fashion illustration portfolio look like? Um, I think for me personally is Yes, you need to have your set of skills, but I think having your own voice and your own style and your interpretation and whether that may be using, you know, a material specifically or how you draw a face or in interpret the clothes. I think that makes a really strong portfolio is your individuality. How are you different from everybody else? And I think that's a really big challenge these days because we're so bombarded with the internet. Like you can just copy everybody's style. So the big money question is how do you define yourself as an individual? What do you like? I think those are the questions that you really need to ask yourself rather than, oh, I'm going to copy that because that looks good. Like that's that pretty girl on the magazine cover. So um, taste level has a lot to do with it. Of course, you have artists and illustrators you look up to. And I had the same when I was going to uni. I loved certain artists and they really inspired my work and they influenced my work. But as I started to get deeper into my career, it's like, how do I interpret that how do i take that knowledge and make it my own rather than i'm just copying if that makes sense so if i was to look at a portfolio for a job interview or something um i would uh, look at individuality how you interpret things uh, what you're interpreting Things like that, if that answers your question. Um, I actually have a degree in fashion design. So yes, it's very different. Um, fashion design is like obviously designing garments, whereas in fashion illustration, you're actually interpreting other people's garments. I guess you can do both because um, fashion illustri illustration is a very important part of fashion design is actually how you sell your work. So if you have a fashion design portfolio, you should have illustration to kind of tie everything together. And it's the selling point for your clients or your job interview. Um, and fashion design, you have to be very, you can be creative, but technical. So you have to show what the garment is where actually fashion illustration is showing the mood, the theme. So it doesn't have to be like a technical drawing. It could be an interpretation. So yeah, I think it's more of a mood thing in creating this fantasy where this, create, um, this character is wearing the clothes, if that makes sense. No, I'm adding color. <laughs> so I'm adding my lips. I'm just waiting for it to dry. So that's my second value layer on top. So let's give her a little bit of color because she looks a bit dead. So I'm taking my color pencil and I'm just adding some color. Actually, I'm going to add more pink. I can't remember where I put it. 
it's gone. Oh, let's see. So let's give her some cheekbones. I don't really like to put a harsh line when I'm drawing um, cheekbones. You know those 90s drawing that have that for a cheekbone, like really harsh. I think we kind of moved on from that strong 80s look. So I can chisel out her face a bit more with these colors. And what's quite exciting about fashion illustration is that you don't have to be so um, precise. You can just put a shadow here if you want to. It's like designing. I think because I come from such a traditional background where I did learn traditional anatomy and all that stuff. It's kind of ingrained in me, so I, it's hard for me to break out, but I've been experimenting on my own to be a bit um, open to trying new ways and trying to break the rules, really. So a bit of color. That's not bad. Let's see. Oops. It's just a, um, so why do you use watercolors and pencils to add color? It's just a technique I've devised on my own. So I think that answers the previous question somebody asked me. Um, because there's so many good traditional painters and, you know, they have those books on how to use these techniques, or it's very traditional. But I've always been curious about how I can use it and interpret it in a non-traditional way. And I think that helps me explore my style and how to come up with something different rather than that, that way that watercolor drawing works. For example, David Downton is really famous, but there's so many people who do watercolor just like him. Um, because it's so good, obviously. But I wanted to know how I can interpret it into my own way and try to figure out, you know, make things different rather than the traditional way that's already been done, right? So it's like fashion. You are trying to find new ways to do things, new ways to interpret. Does that answer your question? All right, so I'm going to solidify this a bit more. Each time. Ooh, good question. So as a fashion illustrator, should it be anatomically correctness or just capture the essence? Um, from my experience, because I'm, I have a traditional background where I went to art school, I learned anatomy, I learned all this stuff, that I really value that information, that knowledge, because it works as a base, like a foundation. So if you go into a class and just like, just be creative, just do what you want, you kind of stuck, especially when you're first starting out, where to start, right? But if you have this like foundation, I know how the body works. I know how it looks like. And then that creative stuff can come on top. So imagine you're building a house. And I always <laughs> use this reference for my students who already heard this. Um, if you don't lay the foundation out and you try to build a house, say you're ex building the exterior, you build the exterior and you're just painting these pretty colors on top, right? But your house is gonna collapse. So if you don't have those pillars to uphold your drawings and anatomy, life drawing, gestures, like those understanding are the foundations that are gonna uphold your drawing. And what it does is actually, it gives you more depth and knowledge that 
you can use. And it's always going to be there. So it's a structure that upholds your drawing rather than just decorating. You know, you're just drawing this pretty, like, pretty girl. But once you have that knowledge, you will see the difference. Like, you can explore more of emotion, you know, different experiments, but you always have that base to start from. So it's kind of like you're growing out and you're branching out. Almost like leveling up when you're playing a game. You want to do, you want to master these levels, and therefore your work has more meaning and more depth. If that answers your question. But no, you don't have to be anatomically anatomically correct. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna add my next value. Really punch up the color. Considering highlights, that's too strong. Okay, that's good. I think I'm gonna add more eye makeup on her, since this is my interpretation. Is that some gold eyeshadow? Gold on the bottom. Social social media as an artist. What? Ooh. I've been kind of grappling with this myself this year, I think. I've been I guess when I was starting out as a fashion illustration. We had Tumblr, we had um, like uh, blogs that was reblogging the work. So it's quite free in a way. It wasn't in your face all the time. And I think, especially with lockdown, social media has been in your face constantly. And it does give a lot of pressure about creating work, like churning them out and Sometimes for me, I see it as like a sketchbook task. So I post my process because I'm constantly drawing anyways. But I can see how that can affect your mind and give you a bit of anxiety, which I don't think is healthy because you can't really do good work when you feel like you're anxious and you need to produce and you need to post it. So it is a battle that I really struggle with as well but ultimately if you do what you love then I think that will spur you on but be careful with looking at too many other people's work uh, because that can affect the way you see your work so I try not to look at other people's work too much of course I appreciate what everybody's doing. I think it's great, but I try not to look at it so I don't be influenced so much, but I try to practice more by myself on my own or do life drawing, which is a great way to find your own style because you can experiment. But yeah, it's a great tool and how brilliant it is that we can actually sell our own work online and we have total control of what we put out there. But I do say it's a fine balance between using it as a tool or letting it consume you. Anyway, does that answer your question? Is that the aspect that you're asking about social media or how you can connect with other people? I think it's a great tool. Um, I th I'm the generation that came up with when social media was starting out. I didn't have a cell phone when I was in high school, <laughs> which is funny to think about that now.
I'm adapting as well because um, I'm learning social media sometimes from my students because there's so many new things all the time. Oh yeah, I do a whole um, anatomy step. Like I'll take tracing paper, I'll check the anatomy, but that's because I'm really obsessive with that part because I enjoy it. Um, oh, sorry, I thought we interpreted the question wrong. Yeah, I do, yeah. You don't need to commit too much to the actual photo. But if you want to, you can. But definitely, that's the power of illustration. You can change however you want, whatever you want. It's still wet. OK, so I actually cut out her hat. So I made a well, tracing paper hat, cut it out on another one. So I'm going to collage that on top, but before I do, I'm going to paint it. A bit of that. It's a bit dark. Quite fun. Let's put some furry textures with my paintbrush. You can tell um, I don't paint in a traditional way because I'm a draftsman. So wherever I look at an image, I look at it in lines rather than values. So I knew from when I went to art school that I was not a natural painter. And that you can identify it by the way you look at things. Do you see it in values or do you see it in lines? So I wasn't that great at painting when I went to uni, especially oil painting. That was my <laughs> downfall in a way. I think in a year or two, after I've practiced collage for a bit, I'm going to start learning oil painting just to challenge myself, really overcome, overcome that fear I have. So when you're doing art or anything creative, I think you have to be prepared that it's a lifelong pursuit, that it's never going to stop. So you might as well start somewhere, right? And the most important thing is that you really enjoy what you do or else you won't last long. Right, that's a cool hat. I'm going to oh, get my tail. So I got this um, foamy tape, it's from Scotch. So you can see it has a bit of depth. So I like to put it on. Let's cut that. And I fold it over so it creates more depth. Maybe even one more time. So put that in there. Yeah. Now we have a 3D hat naturally creates the shadow. I can put my finger underneath. So then I can go back in, maybe shade in the hair a bit more. You can see underneath. Cool. Let me move it around actually. Yeah, that looks a bit better. Right. This part I'm leaving a bit abstract, 
because I have my 3D. So I've got some tracing paper actually, and I've made this beforehand. I folded it. So I'm trying to mimic <laughs> that. So I cut some layers out and I folded them. And I actually made a little top. With my tracing paper. So I quite like using tracing paper because you can see underneath. Gives more um, depth. So I'm just going to erase my outline because I'm a perfectionist. Oh, tracing paper. So this is um where is that show the cover? Do I have it? Oh yeah. So I don't know if you're in America, but this is the one you can find in the States. But of course you can find other ones in different countries. But this one somehow is a bit translucent. It's not clear hundred percent. It's a little bit translucent. So you can see that. And it has a little bit of texture. It it really much looks like the tool in this Givenchy look. So that's quite fun. I started to come up with this um, collage idea because I felt like I needed to do something more tactile because everything is so digital. It's quite nice just to play with <laughs> your hands and make something. Also makes me feel like I'm back at school. I can fold that even more. Unfortunately, I tried to find um, tape that's similar to this, but then I recommend using a framer told me about this tape. It's called Filmoplast. Apparently, double-sided tape is very acidic, so it'll eat through the paper in the, over the years. So this one is actually non-acid. So you can get this on Amazon, but it's really nice because it's translucent as well when you peel it off. Actually, I'm going to peel that off. So I'll show you. So let's peel this. Yeah. That. So it's a bit clear. You can see my finger underneath. So I'm going to use this to take that bit. Yeah. And then I'm going to put that underneath. Then you can see a little bit of her back here. So I'm going to come on that one. I love small details, so I'm obsessed. Right. You know what? I think I could make this a bit darker. If you have any other questions, feel free. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Anatomy is the basic, especially if you're doing anything figurative. Uh, especially for fi fashion design students, I'm always puzzled about how you can design clothes when you don't really understand the body. And drawing is a great way to study the body because then you can communicate it into 3D form. And what I mean by 3D form, as I can show you here. So I have an arm here, right? 
Try to be. So then imagine it as a cylinder. A cylinder, right? Let's draw that 3D here. Can you see my camera stuck? Okay. So if you can see here, let's say that's my arm. I'm drawing it. I'm adding contour lines. Okay. So it looks 3D, right? If I was to draw that same shape, but it's flat, I'm doing straight lines. It's flat. So understanding these structures, and of course, if you know anatomy, there's a muscle the bicep. Oh, sorry, not bicep. I always say bicep. There's a muscle on top of the shoulder here. Therefore, when you draw it, there's a bump here, and then it goes straight in. And then we have the elbow, there's a bump here. You know that, it's like subtleties, but it makes the drawing more realistic, I guess. And then if you want to stylize it, you know, you can always elongate it. Once you know the structure, it's really easy. You know, draw a long arm or something. So because I know it's round. Sorry, I should have done this. I can follow the curve, knowing that structure. And of course, the elbow is here, so I know this is darker. It's going inside, so it does help. In... So you're not like doing anything blindly, <laughs> like going in the dark in the cave, trying to figure stuff out. It's just a nice starting point. All right. So I'm not going in too much detail because this is underneath. Just want to define the shapes. So I put that on. I'm just going to draw the other side. Let's draw into this. It's like a little detail here. It's a bit white, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. It's dark in the bottom. Yeah, definitely. I think in fashion, there's no like set rules. You can do anything, can you? You can actually um, do bits of it, not the whole thing. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting. I mean, you do have to use it smartly because you don't want to just do the whole thing. You want to have variations. I think a really good uh, fashion drawing in terms of design, is that when you use 2D um, drawing, collage with paper with different textures, but the ratios have to be really good. If you have one overpowering too much, it could kind of suggest that you're lazy in a way. <laughs> you have to make it aesthetically look good. Because I know I've been a fashion design student before, and I know if you don't have time, you collage the whole thing. So let's put that in. Mm. Looks good. Right. So at this point, I can cut her out, put it in a different background, or I can just paint in the background. Maybe I can try painting it. Oh. Let's see, blue, blue and white. 
It's too dark. I'm gonna try this. Okay, I'm gonna try this. We'll see how it looks. Since the image background is a bit blue, maybe it'll help lighten up the white paper here. I think. Go over there. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't look so bad. Oops, sorry. Work efficiently. Ooh. In what way? Work efficiently. Uh, I have an organizer that I try to commit three hours a day to my personal work and then three hours to work, work, work for a client or a commission or or something or something technical that I'm doing but I always save a session for me like my personal work because I, I think it's important to carry that on and that you know compartmentalizing your time will help you work more efficiently so you set out blocks this three hours I'm going to do this and the next session I don't know why I think of sessions three hours I think because I've been teaching for a while but if you do break up your time in that way perhaps you'll be more efficient you see I'm going behind this hat so it's, yeah I think the darker background helps the hat come out a bit more Ooh, it's a tricky question. How can you succeed? <laughs> um, I think that first starts out with what your level of success is, what you think it is. Is it being on the cover of Vogue or... I think for me personally, because I'm so, I'm such a, artist and worker, I think the more time you put into it, and love, of course, is being successful, is doing your practice every day, and really committing to your craft, and working on yourself as a person is a very successful fashion illustrator. And of course, you know, finding your style as well your own identity and just keep going and you'll find success. <laughs> my personal session, ooh. So my personal session is very, it's a space where I allow myself to make mistakes and so I usually get references and then practice it really with fashion magazines and anything that really inspires me, like a look, a certain look or a certain detail. So that's why I try to practice. But also it can be a life drawing session, which is really valuable because then you can really practice your medium and see what works for you and what doesn't like what combinations of materials that work for you during the session hmm. 
I think the blue adds to it. Maybe it makes it a bit messy. But I guess you can see underneath. That's good. Probably I'll have to do it in a more graphic way. Straight away, sign a new client. Ooh. I think most of my clients come to me because of my style, the way I draw things, rather than can you draw this in the style. So probably having your own style and identity is really important. Is that if that answers your question? <laughs> um, so the background, I'm not really happy with it, but I will probably add layers to it and then see what happens. <laughs> you just have to try and see what works. Maybe that's better. Yeah, I think a more less textured flat background works better, but that's really hard with watercolor. So you need to maybe use a different medium, but since I've started. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, sometimes I do. I think it depends on my mood, but that was something I was exploring. So Maybe I can try that now. Maybe even half of it, half of it, we can cut out. You can see. So now we'll create something completely different. So even that, let's see how that looks. Interesting. Yeah, so I'll probably cut out the whole thing because I probably messed up the background. What I like about this technique is that um, you can mess up and you can cut it out and you can redo it, redo sections and then put it back in. So that's what you learn uh, in my Domestica course. Can you hear me? Okay, because my earphones ran out of battery. <laughs> so yeah, I was saying that's what you learn in my Domestica course is about collage and hopefully I try to emphasize that it's okay to mess up and it's okay to really cut things out and re redo them. So it, it, get, it alleviates that pressure of trying to create that amazing drawing the first time because it never really works the first time anyways. And then it, the more you practice that, I feel like it, you forgive yourself for messing up and actually you work with it. So the mess ups actually enhance the drawing. So I'll continue this side and then we can See what happens, and then we can finish. Any last questions you can ask me before we finish the live session? I'm cutting this out. Yeah, you can see the side now. It's quite different when it's cut out. Can you? How can you fight against the fear of mess up your drawing? Oh yeah. Um, so I have a whatever sketchbook, 
So that sketchbook is a cheap one and I use my cheapest pencils. And I practice, I warm up in that sketchbook. So that's the what the messed up sketchbook where you can just draw lines and go crazy. And then once you feel more confident enough, you can go to your normal drawing sketchbook. But I think the biggest way of um, fighting against the fear is you have to jump into the pool. So you have to jump in and actually start putting your lines down, getting your hand used to drawing the line, like that tactile feeling. And then I think it will click one day. We'll just kind of get over it. And then because if you think that you can throw it away afterwards or it's just in your whatever sketchbook, then it alleviates that pressure of this is the final drawing. It needs to be amazing, right? So that's how I got over that fear. And I started to use markers to really get over that fear because markers, you can't do control Z. You have to really live with the line. And once I started to use markers as a starting point, it helped me get over that fear a lot because you have to accept it. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, I draw lots of different stuff, but I love faces because for me, it has so much emotions I can express and there are just so many things that you can work with that I love doing portraits, but I also love the body looking out to me and stuff. So it depends on my inspiration, I guess. But I do practice portraits when I'm sketching it. In the drawing, it came right. It came right. It's all about the style. How's your style in the drawing? This one, this drawing here. How is the style in the drawing come right? I'm a bit confused about that question. How is, how is your style? <laughs> I'm not sure. How's your style in the drawing? It come right. Any other questions? This. Ooh, uh, depends on what you're doing. I, for my final illustrations, I love arches paper. Let me see if I have any. Okay, so this one, oh, sorry. This one's quite pricey. If you can see that, I think my phone's, oh yeah. It's a bit pricey, but I use this for my final illustrations, like if I'm making gallery pieces or any other watercolor paper, like Fabriano is good but it depends on your budget, I guess. But if you're practicing, I just use really crap, <laughs> crap paper, or in my sketchbook, it's a moleskin, which I love. So every year I try to have one moleskin for the year, unless I finish it. But this paper is quite good because you can, you know, you can draw paint on it and it takes the water a bit well. Let's see what's happening. Oh yeah, I drew this the other day. My phone's getting <laughs> and this is paint, so you know you can really go hard on this paper with water and stuff. So most skin, but it depends on what you want to achieve. Who influences me the most? Who are your biggest? I think they're not really considered fashion illustrators, but you know, in, I'm very fascinated by Mucha, Klimt, and they're all in the 19th century. Because um, they have both drawing skills and painting skills. And I think they influenced me the most. Aud Aud Audrey Beardsley, of course, I love. I think those are my top three, I would say. 
And Ego and Shiel as well, maybe top four. They all come from the same area, like Vienna and Czechoslovakia. But I love them and I really appreciate their work because it has a lot of meaning to it rather than just, they have the style, but if you read about them, they have more of how they portray the world, how they looked at the world. So that way it gives their work a lot more depth as well. Yeah, those are my top four, which will be covered in the domestic course under my influences. Which kind of works do I usually do? Um, yeah, fashion. I started out with fashion. Um, when I was in uni, I took a class and I really love fashion illustration. And I think I just, it came from that. But then after I studied fashion design, I wasn't sure anymore. <laughs> so I went back to illustration, but I love drawing women, I suppose. That's what it is in these characters rather than the clothes itself. I think I, I've evolved in that way. So I'm doing more, I'm evolving and looking at it differently, which I focus more on the person rather than the clothes. The garment is kind of secondary. So I guess that's what I'm doing now. I'm just experimenting and drawing things I find very beautiful and try to maybe hopefully fill the world with beautiful things <laughs> while I can, because it's been so dark in the past four years. So yeah, um, hopefully you enjoyed the session and liked my interpretation of Audrey Hepburn and hopefully see you again in my Domestica course. Thank you, goodbye. The idea is like something very fragile. I'm going to show you some examples. This is what we've got behind me. What more questions do you have here? How did you discover that you were here?